Hey guys, I'm Ernie, um, and I'm excited that he said badass because now I know we can cuss, so this whole presentation's got a lot easier. Um, so my goal, I'm gonna kind of go through a couple things here. Um, oh, this is this is just from our website, so let's go in here and set this up. Perfect. Uh, I'm gonna walk you guys through what we do with Carvana, um, kind of how it works, um, what drives our strategy, how we think about that. Um, I've got some flickering, where we've struggled. Um, I think what I'm gonna try and do throughout this whole talk is kind of weave in things that are hopefully generally useful to people that are in similar situations. Um, and then kind of what lessons we feel like we've learned and what we feel like that kind of means for the next couple of years for tech in general. So I think that's the goal of this. I want to set that up really quick. Um, you already kind of heard what we do. So what we do is we sell cars online. I think that's definitely not the motivation um, for, for what we kind of chose to do. What we wanted to do was make car buying not suck so bad. Um, and I think that kind of the internet uh, and a, a number of digital tools end up being really good tools to help us to do that. Um, but we sell cars online, that means we do the entire thing. So we're basically a dealer without a showroom. We're acquiring cars, we're conditioning cars, we photograph them instead of putting them on a front line. Uh, we build out proprietary photography and kind of player technology that lets customers go on our site, spin cars around. Um, they can purchase the car on the site, that includes financing. Um, and then we deliver it to their door or they go pick it up at a vending machine. So we'll talk a little bit more about all of that. These are just some pictures to kind of bring that to life. So this is one of our inspection centers. Um, obviously, it's not like a normal kind of tech startup. We have real operations with lots of people. Um, and that gives you a sense of, of one of the inspection centers that's in Wyander, Georgia. Um, that's our website. That's a car that's been photographed and is in that kind of spinner. So customers can spin it kind of either way that we have 16 images with the door, doors closed, doors open. And then we also take kind of a 360 spherical image of the inside of the car so customers can move around, check it all out. I think the goal of this was um, pretty interesting statistics. Basically, you know, car dealerships have been around for 75 years. Um, they haven't changed any meaningful way. The costs to deliver that dealership experience to customers have largely kind of stayed constant in real terms, um, but yet customers are getting less and less value every day out of dealerships. Today, 18% of these car buyers don't test drive a car. An additional 30% test drive only a single car. And so you start to wonder, you know, how valuable are these dealerships and why have their cost structures not evolved? I think there's a lot of interesting historical reasons for that that we won't dive into because it would take too long, but we thought that that created a lot of opportunity and we wanted to provide information to our website instead of through a physical uh, lot experience. Um, this just kind of shows our dial. So 20% of our customers buy a car in 20 minutes or less. Um, and that means like the entire experience. That means picking the car, clicking buy this car, getting approved for financing, selecting financing for every customer car combination. Uh, we calculate 10,000 different combinations of financing terms and they can navigate them with those dials up there. Uh, it's to the penny exactly what they're gonna pay. Uh, they can get a warranty, they can sign contracts and they can schedule delivery uh, or pick up. And then when they take receipt of the car, they get a seven day return policy, which is another really good way to convey information when you don't have a physical dealership at a very, very low cost. We have on the order of 4% returns, um, which when you do the math on what does it cost to go pick up a car from a customer and bring it back, it ends up costing you less than 10 bucks to kind of support that return policy. And that's clearly a better information gathering mechanism than kind of four right turns around a dealership. Um, this kind of shows you know, our place or yours, we will deliver the car to you uh, on that brand hauler, or you can pick it up on our vending machine. This is our first vending machine in Atlanta. Um, and then we did just launch our next vending machine, which I think when I click this magical button, the video is going to play. Um, and so you guys will all see that. Perfect. that they're like, wait a minute, didn't you just kind of talk for 45 minutes, or in this case, maybe five or six minutes, about kind of costs and that being the root of all evil in automotive retail? Isn't that thing really expensive? I won't go through all the math, but it's really not. Um, we can deliver about three times as many cars uh, out of that thing as a CarMax dealership can, can kind of sell in a month. Um, it costs on the order of 10% as much to build as a CarMax dealership. Uh, it was a lot of work up front, but it's very, very inexpensive to run. It's nearly costless to run incrementally. Um, so we're able to still kind of offer that experience and keep price really low. So, um, you know, I, I think something that's always interesting when you're trying to think about kind of startups in general is how do you 
you know, people always ask, like, where did the idea come from, right? Like, where, where did this all start? And I think too much credit generally is probably given to ideas, because um, I think, you know, ideas come much, much easier than building anything that actually works. Uh, but the way that we try to think about everything we do is kind of through this frame of make the pie bigger. And I put that quote up there at the top, um, just kind of it's a, a joke from Gavin Belson, who's awesome in Silicon Valley. Um, because I think that generally in, uh, in tech, people can kind of get a little bit aspirational and ideological and kind of full of themselves and what they do. And I think, you know, the reality of what we do is we sell cars. You know, we're not, we're not curing cancer, we're not, you know, feeding babies in Africa, like we're selling cars, but we're doing something we think makes the world a little bit better and that people that buy cars from us save 1500 bucks, they save four hours at a dealership, they get treated like an adult, um, you know, they get seven days to kind of decide if they want to return the car. And so in all kind of the important decisioning dimensions, we think that customers are meaningfully better off. And I think that that's kind of how all startups probably should think about the problem because all startups have this property where there's no reason you should win at whatever you want to do. It's like there's always a company out there that's better positioned to do literally anything than a startup. You know, startups by definition shouldn't ever win at anything. And I think one of the major advantages that startups have is you have to think about things through the lens of make your customer's life better instead of looking at it through the lens of how do I increase you know, gross margins by 3% next quarter so my shareholders are happy. And I think that when you start to do the latter, which is kind of a natural evolution of all companies, you necessarily lose a little bit of focus on the thing that's most important and ensures survival because you're trying to kind of monetize the survival that you've already earned. And I think that just creates susceptibility over time. And so we always try to think about keep the customer first, don't get too focused on kind of quarter to quarter metrics, make sure you set up your investors that they're gonna understand that that's how you're gonna think about things so that they don't force you to look at things quarter to quarter. Um, but that's how we that's how we kind of thought about everything. Um, I think that anytime you're going to start something, you have to decide. There's there's all this talk in startup land about pivots and lean startup, and there's all the like buzzwords. My personal view is that pivots are maybe okay at best, um, but that you have to decide to believe something. Like I think every startup ever, well maybe not every startup ever, the vast majority of startups go through a lot of really tough times, kind of on their path from starting to getting going. And you have to have conviction to make it through those tough times. And I think that too often, you know, like we you know, we talk about pivots, like they're these heroic moves, when really I think that, that can be very destabilizing. And it's like what should happen is before you, in my opinion, before you start, you should think deeply about what you kind of believe in. And you should totally buy into that and, you know, just like chart the course and not move off it. And then I think you're supposed to listen to the signals that come in from the market on kind of lower level beliefs, but you have to have conviction about something or you, you can't build it. It's like you'll just constantly kind of float around in the wind and change you know, whimsically. So we kind of have two core convictions. One is give customers great experiences, or at least I think the bar has been set so low that it's give customers experiences that don't totally suck. I mean, like everything above that is really good. And, and so far, customers seem to love it. And I don't know if that 4.9 is like a general 4.9, or if it's just like relative to buying a car the old crappy way, you're at 4.9. But either way, we'll take 4.9. Um, and you know, we've got, I think now we have 1,300 views up on the website. And this is kind of how we try to think about everything. It's just how do we make our customers really happy? And I do think, I'll dive into the economics for a second. Buying a car is a really crappy experience. Someone kind of knows this. But then it begs the question of why, right? Like why do people hate buying cars? It's something about the product. It's something about the process. If it's something about the process, why hasn't it been fixed before? Like, there's a lot of deep questions there that, that are worth diving into. And so, without going into too much history, uh, I think um, I'll just say that basically, kind of franchise dealers effectively have 10 mile kind of monopolies, um, and they have for 75 years. And so, they operate inside these 10 mile monopolies with very little competitive pressures from the outside world. Also, for historical reasons, um, you know, manufacturers are not able to shut them down, even for things like bad customer service or whatever else. And so what's happened is there's this proliferation of dealerships, 35,000 dealerships around the country. And they all do things the exact same way. They all use, kind of, they have a 10 mile monopoly, so there's not a lot of pressure. They use the same software products. You know, many of the biggest name brand retailers that you know of use 30 or 40 third party software products. They hire the same people, they buy the same real estate, they sell the same product. There's just nothing that's actually different. 
And so the way they differentiate themselves is they have to monetize every customer interaction more. And so they sit you in the back and they beat you up for four hours until you give up and give them your money. And that's how kind of automotive retail works. And so the way you have to solve that, and that's, that's like a dark view of it. I'm sure there are people who take exception to that, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty close to like what actually happens. And that's why people have a stomach ache and you buy a car. So in our view, the way you fix that is you have to address kind of the root problem, which is this lack of differentiation. Uh, and especially kind of in the economic dimension. And so we knew we had to reduce costs. We knew the customers weren't getting a ton of information out of test drives. And so we did use all these kind of tools. And, and that's, I think, what underlies kind of or the way that we service Conviction 1. And kind of from that, Conviction 2 is born. So this is basically all the retail expenses. So what this is, is this is labor and then physical uh, overhead expense for all the public retailers. And then there's Carvana. Um, today in Atlanta, which is the most mature market, and then Carvana model for, for 2019, which you know, we're not saying we're going to do totally crazy things, but that gap in expenses is, I think, what allows us to give customers good experiences. Um, and so those are our two convictions, and we don't, like, those things aren't up for debate, right? I, mean, I suppose everything can be debated in, in good spirit, but for the most part, those two things aren't up for debate. The way that we service those things, we debate all the time when we change stuff a lot. Um, but like any startup, I think you know, we went through tough times and we get beat up and we have to go knock on doors and ask for money. And that's when you get beat up the most. And so I want to talk a little about where we've been beat up, right? I think, first of all, the job of an investor is, you know, to sort of make friends with you so you want their money more than anyone else's money. And then to like kind of beat you back, right? Like they've got to try and get the best entry price they can possibly get. And there's nothing wrong with that. So when you go talk to investors, you're going to hear bad things. It's like, that's just part of the process. It's like they're going to find the holes. There's holes in every business. And so what are the holes people pointing to for us? So for us, it was our gross margins are too low, and our formatting is way off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so every investor, and as part of the history of the world, I think this isn't like a venture capital thing for this moment, uh, says your gross margins are too low. But that's what we get beat up on all the time. We sell a $20,000 product. Uh, you know, even kind of the, the best in the business, CarMax, uh, does about $3,700 of gross margins, so they do on the order of 18% um, gross margin per transaction. So there's a lot less gross margin in the transaction than there are in many other, like, pure software businesses where you're just moving bits around. Um, we're going to talk about why I'm not sure that's a great argument, but it's, it's a very, very pervasive argument. And then pay is the capital intensive, which um, that's like the new, that's like the new in vogue thing where like it's impossible to have a conversation with anyone who's ever stood next to an investor where they don't think about capital life being the best possible business model. Um, and I think that's really wrong too for, for obviously very convenient reasons, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then this was my favorite. So one of our calls, right, like you, you do talk to a lot of investors, you get told no a lot and that's fine. That's like how it's supposed to work. But one of my favorite calls, I was talking to a really, really well-known, very well thought of uh, venture capitalist. And the conversation sort of ended with the quote at the bottom where he was like, these, these competitive models, speaking to models that are competitive with us, are so capital efficient that they're gonna be able to raise so much capital that you can't keep up. And so it was like that comment sort of reduced to, they don't need any money to be huge, so they're gonna be able to get so much money that they're gonna be huge. And it was like, what's, what's not fitting here? Like how come, how come you can make that statement, have that be a real statement? And I think, in my view, we'll get into it a little bit more in a second. Losses are a cost of capital too, and losses are a function of not great customer experiences when you're worrying too much about your business model and not enough about your customer experience. And I think that oftentimes there's a lot of business models today that are getting funded and created because there's this hyper focus on kind of capital lightness where they're not really building the best solution for customers. They're building something that looks really capital light. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best, the best way to be thinking about these things. So what I'm about to do is react emotionally and then lash out. So I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to let everyone know that. So I'm going to talk about a couple companies. Um, these companies I'm going to talk about are great companies. I don't take exception at all to their business model or the value you create in the world or where they're going to be in 10 or 20 years. I do take exception to, I think, the way they're commonly thought of and their valuations. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And I think it causes real problems. Um, in the economy. So these graphs are <coughs> Salesforce. So if you're investing in a company like Salesforce, the thesis is sort of like, okay, they've got really, really high gross margins on the order of 
So what's going to happen is they're going to grow, and as they get to more and more scale, their SGNA is just going to get squashed down to nothing, and you're going to monetize. Like you're just going to have huge margins forever. You're going to make a ton of money, and then. If you, even if you give up on that argument at some point, then you say, well, yeah, but at some point they can turn it off and they can monetize big loss money. Well, when you look at the data, it's like you can see on the left their revenue growth. So over this period of time, 2003 to 2015, their revenue grew 100x. So presumably there's some scale being created there. But their SGNA's percentage of revenue, which is the graph on the right, has stayed completely flat, which is the definition of a variable cost. It's like that's not changing. That's not getting better as they get scale. It's not happening. So like. There's something wrong. And even worse, income over revenue is dropping, is now negative, and they're losing on the order of $300 million a year. And the reason for that is because they're investing more in R&D. And, so, and not, not just more in dollars, more as a percent of revenue. So you invest in R&D to grow revenue. That's, like the, that's the way that you defend investing in R&D. But yet they're investing more and more as a percent of R&D, and they're growing, or excuse me, as a percent of revenue, and they're growing revenue more slowly. So what I think kind of is going on there is that it's like competition is a cost and capital lightness, which we're going to get to in a second. I've got my other little special point I like to make. So capital lightness means competition heavy, and it, it means competition heavy for a lot of reasons. One, it's easy to do. Two, it's really valued today, so there's a lot of incentive to continually invest in these companies. So if you're Salesforce, we'll talk about that when we come to Facebook in a second. If you're Salesforce. It's like you, 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 you're building a software product, but there's all these people now that just have this $50 billion incentive to come copy you, right? It's like, and you know that you have to keep your product up to snuff, so you're investing in SGNA. Like, that's not going away. It's like you, the way you were born into the world is you kind of, you know, built out this cloud concept that everyone's buying into, which basically means you've massively reduced switching costs, so you made it really easy for people to change from software product to software product to software product which the byproduct of that is now you have to keep making your product the best or they're gone, right? Because someone else will. And it's like, what can you do with $50 billion valuation? You can keep a bubble going in Silicon Valley forever to, to, to finance tons and tons of startups that'll just keep eating at you, eating at you, eating at you. And so I think that shows up in Facebook. And so if you look at Facebook, far left, that's earnings lifetime. In the middle, it's trailing 12 month earnings. On the right, it's acquisitions. So like, you know, we talk about WhatsApp, you know, WhatsApp and how you look at it, you talk about the cash price or what it actually ended up being with their stock price. It's 19 to 22 billion, I use 19 for that. But so, what does $22 billion do? $22 billion is enough to where a pool of venture capitalists that wanna make 20% a year for five years can fund 2,000 startups to the tune of five million bucks each. It's like, you finance a generation to just come take pop shots at you forever. That's what you did with that. Like that's that's what happened with that acquisition. And the question is, it's like if an asset is only worth the cash that ultimately comes out of it, if you're constantly outlaying cash to buy your competitors so that they don't take you down, and you're not making enough money to offset that, you're not worth anything. Like you're valueless. And so, and I'm not saying that Facebook is valueless, but I do think that it's so overvalued that it creates massive incentive for people to come in and compete with it. And so the equilibrium the market has to find is Valuations have to drop, reducing the incentive for more people to compete, reducing valuations for all of us, reducing the number of competitors that are coming out of Silicon Valley, and therefore reducing the risk that they get squashed down to zero. And like, in my opinion, that's going to happen, and I think there's implications for that. So, you know, when, when does all this kind of thing happen? I think, you know, people, um, something I always like to think about is, like, you go to school and you learn all these like rational market hypothesis or hypotheses and you, you have all these kind of thoughts about how things work. But then it's like you get out of school, and for me I went to finance first, and you see that there's technical traders in the world. And you're like, well, how how do I defend the existence of a technical trader like with any economic theory at all? And you really truly cannot. It's like technical traders shouldn't exist. They all technical trading basically is, is it's identifying human emotion in the shapes of stock charts that tend to replicate themselves. So prices that go up tend to go up. You know, prices that go down tend to go down. Prices that kind of do a head and shoulders, I don't know what that means, but they do a head and shoulders. And so the, the reason is because people are making decisions based on those things. Like people choose to buy a stock because it went up. They're not doing their own analysis. And like that means there's momentum in ideas and momentum gets broken when there's pain. And momentum doesn't get broken when there's not pain. And so, I think there's a lot of things happening right now that are creating pain that are going to make people reevaluate a lot of these assumptions. And so these are the sorts of events that create pain. But like, 
square goes out at 65% of the valuation that they got their last private round there. Um, you know, Dropbox gets marked down by Fidelity by 25%. Zenfits gets marked down by 48%. You know, Snapchat, which by the way is maybe the next one that Facebook's gonna have to buy, gets marked way down. Um, and, and public companies start missing numbers. It's like all of a sudden people start, to, they stop and they think. And it's like, wait a minute, like we've been beating this drum of capital light, high gross margins, but like these companies with high gross margins aren't monetizing. And it's probably because valuations are really out of whack. And now way too much focus in the economy is being put on these companies that are doing these same things over and over and over again. And the analogy I like to use for that is I feel like it's a lot like the housing bubble. It's like probably not as sinister today as the housing bubble was. But what happened in the housing bubble is you have kind of interest rates drop. You have a real fundamental. You have you know general prosperity happening. So you get increases in home prices that are real. Those real home prices start to get a little bit of momentum. You know, people start to innovate in the wrong sorts of ways, so they start to come up with IO mortgages and 40-year AM mortgages, and all these things that basically just reduce payment for the same amount of principal, which is equivalent to <coughs> increasing principal for the same amount of payment. And then people start buying more and spending more on houses. You know, all of a sudden, home builders are like, this is awesome. I can do the exact same thing and make a ton more money because they're worth more now. So they start building a ton of houses. And then you just have a glut of houses and you have a glut of people that work on houses and like things fall down. <coughs> and you know, my not super uplifting view is that some of this stuff is gonna fall down because it's I think it's equally poorly thought through um, and, and equally difficult to defend fundamentally. And so what I'll try and get a little more uplifting is I think that the, the fundamental problem is people are thinking too much about business models and not enough about customers. It's like we need to build things that are good for customers. We need to make their lives better, and we need to do whatever we have to do to make their lives better the most efficient way we can. We don't need to build a capital light business model or be a marketplace because it's a marketplace or have high gross margins because, man, then I'm going to be able to raise money easier. It, and I think that that's happening too much, and I think it's just it's pushing innovation in a little bit the wrong direction, and I think it's probably going to stop. And so I think for people interested in this space, it probably means like when there's pain, it doesn't immediately rationalize. It's not like they're going to be all of a sudden, oh, well, let's figure out the companies that actually have a path to profitability and that are building great customer experiences, and let's just keep valuations high for them. It's going to be like, pull back. Nobody can have my money, I'm afraid. And so I think we all need to be really thoughtful about what that means. Um, I know we're trying to raise you know, more money very soon because I think we want to try and stay away from that. Um, but I think that every startup should be thinking about that. Like, is now a good time to raise money? Don't worry if you don't get the valuation you were hoping for. It's like things could probably get a lot worse than they can't get a ton better. Um, and then I think when you're evaluating your business models, think really hard about building a great customer experience. Think really hard about having a real story that shows profitability. You know, investors in good times, they look up the income statement at revenue, and in bad times, it's like straight down at profit. And so I think they're probably <coughs> shifting down the income statement a little bit. Um, and then hold cash near and dear. And that's, uh, that's my message. <laughs>